Hello everyone, welcome to a, another monthly webinar targeted at every Mind at Work app users, but also if you want to come hang with us, then we appreciate anyone who wants to join the session. Really excited for today's session, it's going to be a conversation with me and George, I'm going to bring George in in just a minute. Um, really, you know, inspiring guy, someone who we, I've seen on social media for a long time, we actually haven't connected and, and spoken. So um, you guys get to watch us speak for the first time in today's session. So a really inspiring story. And we're really going to be focusing on dealing with anxiety, hearing George's story, and also looking at creativity and, and a couple of other subjects as well. I just want to give you a quick little test. Can you guys hear me okay? Just give me a yes in the chat box if you can hear me and you should be able to see me and George. George, you just want to say hello so people can... Hi, everyone. <laughs> cool. Sounds good. So we've got Anita, Becky, Amy, Janine. Eric, good to see you guys. Delia, Samantha, Amara, Nikki, Nancy. Cool, we've got more people joining now, which is good to see. So thank you all guys for taking the time out to um to, to join today's session. As we always do before we jump into the conversation with me and George, let us know how you're feeling today. So not overall, how are you feeling today? Let's grade yourself out of 10. 10 that this is the best day ever. One as in you you don't you you know it's a terrible day. George, where are you at today? Between one and ten. Oh, ten's a good day. Did you say? Ten's a good day. Ten's a good day. I'd probably say six. Oh, sorry, seven, seven and a half. I think. You know, I'm up there. It's a good day, but there's still, you know, the lingering kind of negativity outside. But generally, quite good. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, I would agree. I always kind of put myself there. I think it's just a natural. We never want to give ourselves a ten. <laughs> but then naturally, we'll be six or seven. Um, yeah, I would say I'm about six, seven-ish. It's quite got, interesting. Go on. I was just going to say. I was say. just saying we've got um, six, we've got five, we've got seven, we've got five, we've got six-ish, seven to eight, five, three, rubbish week, crap week. Um, Emma, hopefully your your week brightens up. Um, hopefully this webinar today helps that as well. Teresa says seven or eight, and is an eight. So overall good, but equally, as, as I'm sure George will agree with me, you know, if you are a three, if you are a two, if you are a one, you know, it's okay. You know, this this is a safe space to obviously talk about that if you want us to. And at the same time, I've been there. I'm sure George is going to talk about him being there. We've all had those days as well. And it doesn't mean that we can't get through them as well. So thank you guys for, for sharing that. So George, let's just kick it off. Um, Can you just let us know a little, little bit about yourself currently? Yeah, I was first going to say Emma. That was me yesterday. I was definitely a three yesterday. It was a bad day. Um, today I'm feeling a bit better. I, so, I mean, I'm, I'm 24 at the moment. I'm a mental health campaigner and I've also got a little fashion brand, which I started a couple of years ago. Um, so they can't hear or see me, Becky. Oh, is that just Becky guys or is that someone else? Anyone else not here? Okay. Yeah, just Becky. So, um, Becky, I've just said, can you just restart? Carry on, George. Okay, no problem. Um, so, yeah, now I'm 24, mental health campaigner, but also started a brand, a fashion brand many years ago, which I, I, I started from my own suffering mental health problems. Um, it was anxiety, OCD, and panic attacks, which particularly affected me. Um, and I was going through it for about three years. The initial trigger was... Um, it was always there, you know, I always had underlying mental health problems. If you could look at me as, as a, a young person in primary school, um, I would have extra support at home. You know, someone would come to the house and do breathing exercises and counting to 10. This is what I know that that's probably some form of CBT when you're very small. Um, and I had that through throughout primary. I was ran everywhere. I was very hyperactive, which I'm still quite similar now today. Um, and then through secondary school, it sort of dissipated a little bit because I was busy, I was focused, I had a good friends group and it kind of seemingly just went away. And then, you know, through through secondary school, it, 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 it obviously left. And then at the end of secondary school, it was, uh, you know, we'd all finished our GCSEs and we, we you know, we decided to celebrate and, and went to a festival. Um, and I decided, and all of us decided that we'd experiment with some drugs. Uh, and the drug of choice was MDMA, which is uh, not the best drug for someone that A, has anxiety and it's already quite hyperactive. Um, and little did I know that that would become the catalyst to bring back my mental health problems. So I was outside in the horse's field doing the dung when I suddenly felt really hot, you know, tunnel vision, sweating, heart racing. Um, 
and I didn't know what was going on. And I thought I was back on this drug. And I ran inside and told my parents this. And I said, look, I feel like I'm dying. Um, I, th I think I'm on drugs. I don't know what's happening. I was wanted to black out. I wanted to curl up in a ball. I wanted to cry. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, and we called the doctors or the out of the out of hours doctor for surgery. And they said, it sounds like he's having a panic attack. And that was my first experience of a panic attack. And then, and then for, sort of from there, um, you know, it was once a day panic attacks. And in, in about a two week period, my mental health severely deteriorated into you know, suicidal thoughts, um, OCD, washing my hands 50 you know, to 100 times a day because I thought everything I touched uh, had drug traces on it. So that if I didn't have to wash my hands, I would have a panic attack. Um, and the cycle and the vicious cycle kind of started, um, which obviously brought about anxiety. And my world sort of shrunk. Um, and and it was kind of from there that I decided I needed to get help. And then obviously subsequently while I was getting help started the brand. Amazing. And, you know, hearing that story is, is inspiring. And I think <clears> it's, <throat> it's difficult to hear for a lot of people. But as I always say, these conversations we need to have because we need to bring, you know, mental health challenges to the forefront of the conversation and, and hear it from people like you who are so courageous to kind of, you know, share that story. Teresa just seconded that as well. Um, and there's a couple of things that I kind of want to want to touch on throughout this conversation. But I think the I think the first one that stands out to me is, is the panic attacks. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's how they feel. And and as you say, you know, you feel like you're dying. You feel like, you know, for people, they have a heart attack. There's this physical feeling that comes with a panic attack. Um, and I can't imagine, as you said, they're happening sort of every day in your experience and with the help that you got. How did you manage to start to deal with with those panic attacks? Well, the first instance, I mean, the first time I had one, um, <laughs> this is obviously not medically approved, but I got told to go and breathe into a brown paper bag um, and to stop me hyperventilating. I know it can actually be quite dangerous. Um, hence why we send our stuff out in panic attack bags now. But um, that was the way I managed to, to cope with it first. And I used to bring a bag around with me everywhere well, everywhere I went as like a crutch um but as I started to get help and just as a side note uh obviously I went to the NHS and they told me I'd have to wait 40 weeks so my parents could sit, fortunately send me privately um you know and it was quite scary when we came out of that NHS appointment for them to tell me you know, even though I told them I felt suicidal they said well we have to wait 40 weeks um and the first help I received was an uh, adolescent psychiatrist and he was doing hypnotherapy techniques with me. So he was tackling the panic attacks and he was doing it in a way that was uh, almost putting me through the sensations of a panic attack. So every time I had one, I could relate it to a panic attack and not being on the drugs. So if the sensation started, which was quite common, you know, the heart racing, generally the first feeling I felt was a tingling or feeling really hot. And then the second would be the heart racing and then I'd be panicking about the heart racing and obviously it would spiral out from there. Um, so with the hypnotherapy or the, what I was being taught was to recognize that it was a panic attack and it was completely normal human behavior um, that, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a bit hot or oh, my heart start racing. It's okay. You know, it's just a start of a panic attack. There's nothing to worry about. You're not on drugs. You haven't got any drugs in your system. And once you start telling your brain these rational thoughts, it starts calming down and working through that process um, was the most important thing. I think, you know, telling your brain what's happening, because if you don't tell it, it will go off into the worst case scenario and, and goes down the path of least resistance, which is generally the most scary thing. Um, so if you say, actually, you know, it's just my heart was racing a little bit. I'm obviously a little bit anxious. I'm a little bit panicky, but it's OK. It's not drugs. You know, I'm just having a panic attack or starting to have one and then eventually kind of calm down because you've released it to something that's normal as opposed to something that's not normal. Yeah, so. I can I can really relate to that. And, you know, we have some ground and exercises that we have on the app as well that have been recommended by sort of our clinical psychologists when it comes to panic attacks. And I think it is that almost being aware that you're about to have them and preventing them, you know, rather than reacting to them when you're having them. And I think, as you say, you know, I remember my first panic attack, it was a couple of months after my, my dad's suicide 
on 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 the strip of Malia with all of my friends, which is the worst <laughs> place to have a panic attack. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like, I just couldn't, I didn't know what it was. And then I think that not knowing what it was makes that panic attack worse because you're like, what is happening to me? Um, you know, why can't I stop breathing like this? You know, why why am I crying as much as this for me? And um, I think that not knowing is is difficult. And I also want to touch on as well, um, the OCD, which is something you spoke about before we talk about other other stuff and other strategies, which I thought that last one was a really good strategy. I think OCD is the most miseducated illness, <laughs> mental illness out of all of them, you know, and and, and I, I'm open and honest about this, George. Like I cringe at, you know, I said something quite publicly about three or four years ago on my first ever speech about mental health, about OCD, because my slides weren't, you know, in the right place. Mm -hmm. Um and now my education around OCD, you know, the partner in every mind, Adam, he suffered with OCD, intrusive thoughts. I look at my dad's, you know, problems. I do believe my dad might have had OCD. Yeah. And and I think it's so miseducated. Um, what's what's your, you know, from, from what you've had to experience, you know, can you just kind of shed some light on how OCD feels to you? Yeah, so, uh, so OCD can actually be incredibly terrifying, debilitating. So it obviously it makes it a little anxiety, but generally they fuel each other. Um, more often than not, the OCD will be the master of the anxiety. Um, so as an example, obviously I was washing my hands, which is a form of contamination OCD. Um, so if I didn't, if I touched something and I thought, you know, there were drug trace on it, I'd have to wash them. So the obsessive thought, you got the compulsive, um, behavior which would be the hand washing and then from that um and what happens is as, a, as an example so that was then um and it never really goes away you obviously learn the coping mechanisms to be able to deal with it um, and manage it but as an example of how else it can affect you and how debilitating it can be um it comes in many forms and the intrusive thoughts are completely non-voluntary so you can imagine that and they are scary and they feel very real. Um, so to prevent those from happening, um, you, you sometimes have a compulsion to do something. At the moment, I don't. So what I'm going through at the moment is something called ROCD, which is relationship OCD. Um, I'm in a you know a strong relationship. I'm very happy. Um, and generally, that's when the OCD will start to pick you apart. And it will, it will plant a thought completely non-voluntary, that thought will come into your head, you know, what if you cheat on your girlfriend, or what if you don't truly love her, or what if this happens? And as soon as that thought has been planted, you then obsess about it. And you think about it so much, you keep thinking about it, it's called rumination, and you keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it, to the point where it starts feeling very real, almost that you want to just act on it to stop it, which would be obviously breaking up in the relationship, to just stop the thoughts. And generally these thoughts, because they're so obsessive, you know, someone with OCD is highly unlikely to act on them um, because they're so terrified of them. But they can be, they can be incredibly scary. And the, the, the biggest thing to mention is obviously that they are completely non-voluntary. No one is going around with OCD looking for these thoughts. They just pop into the head. Um, you know, we, we, as an example, we all have OCD um, thoughts every now and again you know sometimes they can be positive we all think about i'm i'm not sure how many people on the call now are listening but you sometimes think oh my you know what if i won the lottery and then what would i do with the money that i won the lottery or i could buy a car and then you think about almost actually i might go and buy a lottery ticket so you act on the compulsion you think oh you know you have the thought of imagine if i won the lottery you then start thinking about it more and you think what would i buy if i won the lottery and then you think you keep thinking about it you think maybe i should just go and buy a lottery ticket but that's a positive one, almost positive. You know, you think about it, it doesn't affect you really. You think, oh, it could be nice. Negative ones are completely opposite in the fact that you'll have a thought. It'll be scary and quite disturbing, you know, whatever that be. If it's not ROCD, it could be the fear that you might murder someone or you might rape someone. They can be quite dark, but they're completely opposite. They just pop in and then you think about it, you obsess about it. And then you think, what if I did it? What would happen to me? Um, and the scariest bit is trying to get out of that cycle um which is obviously where the illness comes in yeah and i think you know as i say i think it's a the mental illness that needs more education more understanding and you sharing your story i think is, is going to be a pivotal part of that you know people can start to, to to you know it's not understanding it if you've never experienced it it's not about understanding it but it's showing compassion to it 
and and you know educating yourself on it and you know as i've said i'm not sharing his story but adam who's a pivotal part in in what we do you know he talks about his own ocd and the fact that as you've said you know he used to walk around with handcuffs in his bag because if he didn't do stuff in a certain way he felt like he would be a harm to to other people and yeah. he never acted upon those thoughts but then his problem was that self-judgment of oh my god this is i'm a bad person and then at the same time the stigma that's associated with mental illness causing him to not want to talk about it because if he talks about this you know his 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 perception was people are going to put me in a straitjacket throw away the key and i'm never going to see my family again and I think that's the kind of whole suffering in silence when it comes to OCD and and that really sort of, you know, lack of education around it. Can you can you share a couple of um, insights or charities or, or anything that if someone is someone can relate to what you've just said um, that might be able to get them some help? Um, so in particular, obviously, there is OCD UK and OCD Action. That's for OCD in terms of mental health charities you know, in a wider capacity. There is obviously... Um, mind which is good for resources young minds for younger people and parents with young people suffering they're very um very popular and, and what they do is obviously they help the young people that can't a, afford to go privately but also just encouraging them they're not alone um and also just finding the resources that make you feel like you're not alone you know i say these things obviously i've got ocd and they are scary and sometimes the things i say can be quite shocking um but I say them to encourage other people. You know, there might be someone in the room or the Zoom call um, that might be having the same thoughts, that might be scared about them, that doesn't want to tell someone because they're scared how that person might think. You know, are they actually going to go and murder someone? Do I want to be associated with that person? The truth is that they're probably actually just suffering from OCD. So I say them to kind of encourage other people. And what those charities do, you know, OCD Action, OCD UK, they kind of lay out how you suffer and what it feels like and what it looks like in a way that is relatable but also there's people to talk to you know your other charities and chat lines as well the shout is a big one yeah shout's great and i think you know if you have got access to the app then all of the charities that george has mentioned are embedded into the app as well they all do some amazing work but one thing you just touched on there which i want to want to speak about is that the reason why you do what you do is hopefully helping someone that might be listening to this they can relate to this they can then talk about it how important do you think personal experience is to chip away at the kind of stigma that we still see with mental health i think you know it's the foundations of changing the conversation around mental health um generally everyone suffers from mental health problems at one point in their life you know the the only thing that makes everyone different is the fear of opening up and lived experience is the key that unlocks people to do that you know you can get in a room i'm speaking specifically for young people but older people as well you can get in the room doctor so-and-so psychiatrist with many degrees and a phd but people can't relate to that person they can't relate to a doctor who's got phd you know because they haven't been in his shoes and he's talking from a clinical point of view if you have someone standing in front of you that says as i do you know I, i'm a young man i've got ocd i've got anxiety i have feelings i cry sometimes I you have know, panic attacks. The men in the room, women as well, will think, okay, I'm not alone. I need to listen to this a little bit more. And as an example, I did a, a speech in an all boys school last year. It's about 500 boys. And at the end, um, I had one or two questions. One of the questions was, did you get in trouble for taking drugs? You know, did the police come for you? <laughs> Which is not the questions I was looking for, you know. And I said at the end to the, to the headmaster, I said, did, did anyone listen to what I was, did anyone listen to enjoy my speech? Um, and he said, yes, it's just none of the boys actually know what questions to ask because they've never had someone speak so openly about their mental health like that. Um, and it turns out I got a lot of messages afterwards on my Instagram for those boys that didn't know what to ask in front of their friends because they were scared of how they would look. Um, and by going in front of those 500 boys, you kind of break the stigma and, and say, I'm here in front of you. I've got mental health problems. Let's talk about it. And once you've done that, you've kind of already started the conversation without even realising. You know, they'll go away after the speech and talk about it and say, you know, it was interesting. You know, I, I feel like I've been through something like that before. And then maybe someone else will say to them, actually, yeah, I agree. You know, and then they're starting talking about it. And it's a lot more powerful. Although we need the, the professionals and the clinicians, sometimes people just want to hear relatable stories from other people that they've been through it and they've come out the other side and that there is actually hope. You know, because that's yeah. what people want is hope. 
it brings that human side to mental health, right? I feel like we naturally default when we talk about mental health, we naturally default to mental illness, you know, we naturally link it to that. And, you know, the, the human side of it is you standing up and sharing your story. And I think, you know, this stuff can be learned and this stuff can be applied into businesses, into schools, into society, you know, it's about empowering people to sort of step forward and share. And I think one thing that you really pointed out, which is so key is it's, if you as an, an employee or or whatever stands up and, and talks about your story, you know, naturally we feel like others are going to naturally share back, right? But that's not always the case. But what you can do is you can give that person a glimmer of hope or, you know, it could plant a kind of seed of, well, I might talk about my story, but it might take them a couple of months, but you've kind of started that that process. And I think, you know, as you've said, I've, I've done talks in schools as well, George, and I'm like, this has gone terribly. Like, <laughs> they're not engaged at all. And then afterwards, the teacher said, wow, like, that was really, really good. And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, they didn't talk through it. You know, normally they talk through, um, normally they talk through the speakers, but they just listen to you. So even though they didn't ask any questions, yeah. um, that was key. So I think, yeah, I totally relate to that personal experience is key. Um, I'm conscious that we, we've only got you for a short period of time. Um, I know you've got a meeting as well. So I want to kind of just touch on in terms of lockdown, dealing with anxiety, you know, dealing with your OCD, panic attacks all during this sort of period. Um, any kind of takeaways, any lessons that you've learned that you can kind of share with us? I think, I mean, I sound like a stuck record, but for people that haven't actually heard me say it before, I think the most important thing is just surviving at the moment. You know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, bottom, we're at the bottom now. Uh, there is just surviving, you know, looking after yourself. There's no, one of the most important things I say is there's no right or wrong ways to be doing lockdown. You know, if you're thriving and reading 100 books a day and, you know, building a business, it's going to be multi-million pound. That's absolutely fine. On the flip side if you're lying in bed watching netflix you are working or working from home that's also fine you know you can have duvet days there's no right or wrong way to be doing it um and you know try not to compare yourself to how others are doing it because that will only make you feel maybe worse and obviously you definitely don't want that at the moment so if you're looking at you know lockdown in particular and I, i'm at the moment i'm on the bottom rung of that ladder of maslow's hierarchy needs if you if you want for want of a better way of putting it um it's just surviving, looking after myself, you know, looking, you know, food, water, somewhere to sleep, um, and just being, being uh, kind of kind to myself, you know, not kicking myself if I haven't done a full day's work because no, we haven't been in this situation before. It's it's very scary for many people, most people probably. Um, you know, you've got to think of your love, your loved ones as well. So. Um, just kind of, I suppose, there's no right or wrong way to be doing it and be kind to yourself, you know, look after yourself and just survive um, mm. at the moment. Do do the bare minimum that you need to make yourself feel well. I really like that being kind to yourself. And I feel like we can we can all get in that rabbit hole of comparing ourselves to others and, and wanting to be better and, you know, wanting to constantly improve without realising you know what we have already what we can be grateful for and, and accepting those those down moments as well i think like what you said at the beginning um <clears throat> you know what if you're if you was a free yesterday doesn't mean that you can't be a six tomorrow or a seven tomorrow you know we can all have those those down moments and i've had many of them during this period as well um and and just to kind of wrap up because i know you've got to jump um Sorry, last kind of last kind of uh, i could talk to you for ages george yeah. last kind of um thing that i'd like you to kind of just share if you don't mind is is if someone struggling kind of right now what advice would would you give to them somewhat um firstly first and foremost if you can if you have someone a loved one a friend or someone you trust to talk about it and i would tell them tell them first um, and make sure they're okay before you do you know if someone's struggling you don't want to tell them but i think opening up and talking is the first usually hardest and most important step to say, put your hands up and say, actually, I'm really struggling. Um, as soon as you do that, it might alleviate a little bit of anxiety um, or however you're feeling to know that there is someone there that is happy to listen to you. Um, and do what you need to do to look after yourself. It could be anything, you know, it could be watching a series of Midsummer Murders. It could be going for a 100 kilometer run. Do what you need to do you know, to make yourself feel better um, and just make sure someone knows how you're feeling. Um, 
if you don't have someone uh, maybe use the shout app or some a, a trusted you know service that can help you um, because I think there's nothing worse than going through it alone and obviously you're not alone which is always my bottom line no one is alone when they're suffering um, so telling someone and and saying this is what I'm going through you know I don't necessarily need you to try and I'm not you don't need a counsellor or therapist I just need you to listen maybe what an hour a week or something um, if you have someone to do that that's the starting point amazing George, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Can we show some George some love in the chat box? I'm going to stay on, guys. I apologize. You've only got me for the next 10 minutes. Um, but no, Sorry. I really appreciate you. No worries. I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story. Um, Teresa says you're an inspiration for, for talking about your story today. Um, you know, I second that. I really appreciate you coming on. Just quickly before you go, where can people find out about you if they want to reach out? Um, so... So um, there's a few websites. My my personal website is just georgedavidhodgson.com. If you want to have a look at the brand, and this is, I hope Paul will put it in the chat because it's a, a bit of an annoying oh. name. Don't kind of um, say it. it's maisonchute.com. Now, quickly, the name came from Maison D means house of in French. Chute was an name for my sister Charlotte when I was younger. Um, we're very close. She's always there for me. So it's a little dedication to her and it's house of Charlotte, essentially. So it's maisonchute.com and you can find you know out more about the story um the website and and me basically so yeah and thank you thank you everyone for listening i hope i hope you have best week emma um and everyone's feeling okay in lockdown too and i'm always oh. here for a chat on email if anyone is it amazing george thank you so much thanks paul Excellent. Thanks, thanks george all right okay. thank you Bye. um so i apologize guys like i said you've got me for the next five ten minutes but i just want to kind of just you know as i said personal experience for for me and for every mind is so key and i think you know i share my personal experience you know and i encourage others to if they possibly can you know we don't have to be open books you know sometimes we might want to be a bit more private you know there's stuff that maybe i don't talk about as much in in public as maybe you know um i sh i could but i think it's important that we we empower ourselves and we empower others to talk about their stories around mental health because as george kind of alluded to you know that story can really make someone feel less alone that story can really make someone feel you know oh wow you know i'm not the only one going through this and and obviously i share my story of, of losing my dad to suicide and, and I, I question that a lot with my dad you know if my dad was an engineer if, if someone came into his business and, and did a talk and and was human and spoke about the kind of issues that they were facing would he have would he have then felt less alone and didn't feel like you have to suffer in silence. You know, big reason why we started Every Mind or why I started Every Mind was to create that anonymous safe space on your phone that you can access as an employee to see personal stories and to try and get that. And I think it's so vital that we do this. Um, and I think, you know, if, if it's something that you're not comfortable doing, that's completely fine. But, you know, let's encourage more people to talk about their story and their journey as well. Um, Janine, thank you for bringing George to us. No worries, that was my team. I've got to give them credit for that. Um, so just quickly want to kind of um, say, if you guys got any questions, just feel free to put it in the chat box. But one of the things that, you know, George kind of alluded to as well in terms of um, anxiety was, which I really liked as well, was like, number one, you know, don't be, don't be afraid to talk about it to other people. And, and I think that can come in many forms, you know, as, as George says, you might want to use Shout, which is the 24 seven confidential, you know, tech service, which is less friction. It's less difficult to do because, you know, we're messaging someone that we've never met before and it's anonymous. Um, you know, it could be that we speak to our spouse or we speak to our, you know, parents or a friend for me. It was about speaking to a therapist, you know, a third party, someone that didn't really know much about, you know, my story and my journey. It could be writing it down, writing it down in a note and handing it to a spouse or handing it to a parent and getting them to read it rather than you vocalizing it, you know. But I think it's important that we have that avenue, that person, you know, those people that we can turn to when we are struggling with anxiety. And, and trust me when I say this, the data that we're seeing, um, of course, across the board and the research that we're doing is, is anxiety is at an all time high right now so if you are struggling you know you're definitely not alone with that and then i think as george said it's finding what works for you and there's no way that i can dictate that to you there's no way that george can there's no way that anyone can dictate that this is the blueprint to deal with anxiety to get out of that rut to do you know to feel better there is no blueprint we have to find what works for us we have to try more and we have to 
you know, not be afraid of doing more for our mental health. Um, and what I mean by that is, is naturally I'm still the same, you know, put a yes in the chat box if you can relate to this. It does not come natural to me to look after my mental health. And what I mean by that is when I do, I feel guilty as hell. I'm like, I'll go for a run, right? Running's running's massively helpful for my mental health. Go out for a run. I'm out oh, that to-do list, that to-do list. I've got to do this. I should be working. I should be doing this. Oh, I'm out running. I should have, you know, taken my little boy to school. You know, oh, I should be. And and I feel so guilty for focusing on me just for half an hour, right? And And a couple of people are saying they can relate to that. And that is because we are not conditioned. We're not educated. We're not taught the importance of looking after our mental health, right? You know, I always kind of say I was taught to drink plenty of water, to eat the right foods, to exercise, to proactively manage my mental health, eat an apple a day to keep the doctor away, all of that stuff. So that's all OK. Like, I don't feel I don't feel guilty for eating a, a salad. Right. I know that's good for my my physical health, mental health. I feel so guilty looking after it because I was just taught to ignore it for so long. Right. We're we're educated to ignore it and conditioned to ignore it. So I think, you know, as Janine puts, mental health is every import, every bit as important as physical health. And even though it doesn't fit natural to us, find what works for you and just force yourself to do it every single day. Because, you know, it's almost like um, investing in ourselves. You know, we can become very wealthy if we invest, you know, one pound a day over the next sort of, you know, 20 years as an example, right? So um, my maths is terrible, so I'm not going to work that one out, but I'm sure we could save a lot of money. And it is that, you know, what investments are we making on a daily basis for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour a day? for our mental health that will just pay off um, in the long run. So um, guys, put in the chat box, have you got any questions that you want to ask or anything that you want to share? I'm just going to go through these because there's a couple of ones that I've missed and I wanted to point out, especially the one from, I think it was um, from Mike. Mike says, thanks for sharing. Anyone experiencing OCD, it's so crucial to get help if you start experiencing OCD symptoms. It's not something that will go away by itself. It will only spiral. My dad has it without getting treatment and the effect it has had not only on his life, but on me and my family is so detrimental. Yeah, Mike, you know, OCD is is something that, you know, it tugs at my my heartstrings and it's tugging at my heartstrings right now because I, I do believe my dad, you know, my dad's, and this is being me being brutally honest, right? My dad's obsessiveness to be the best runner, to work hard, to always be busy, to be obsessed with everything that he put his mind into, I thought was him focusing on his performance, right? Being a dedicated um, person. So my dad would run once, if not twice a day. My dad would have to run every day. He would have to write in his book. And, and that to me was just my dad being a dedicated athlete to try and be the best runner that he could be. Um, and then I started to hear, obviously, George's story, you know, Adam's story, uh, another friend of mine, Dan, you know, as I'm starting to hear more and more people talking about their experiences with OCD, I'm like, wow, how wrong was I to believe that OCD was just you want to make sure all of your socks are the same color and you want to make sure that your, you know, your your drawers are tidy. Like that is that is what I was conditioned and educated to believe around OCD. And I'm like, how wrong was I? How wrong have I been to be educated in this way? But as you say, Mike, you're hearing these stories is so key. And, and we all have that ability and we should all focus on educating ourselves a little bit more on it, because just that little bit more education can really help you support others, but also um, understand yourself a little bit more as well. Um, Anita says, I agree that sharing personal stories is brave. It helps others to understand better these issues. And in turn, I hope become more empathetic and have compassion. 100% agree. It's about planting that seed. Yeah, massively, massively agree. And I think, you know, even from a senior leader point of view, guys, like I talk a lot to this about businesses. If you are a senior leader or you manage a team, like you being vocal and honest about your mental health has a massive impact on your team. But at the same time, you can still be a good leader who doesn't openly talk about your mental health challenges to your team. You might just want to do that to your wife, your husband, you know, your family, your friends. That's fine. But at the same time, we all have that responsibility as a senior leader, an employee, a person to show compassion, to encourage others to talk about their mental health. I can be a closed book. I don't have to share my story. But at the same time, I can invite George on to share his story and I can encourage my team to talk about their mental health. And I can understand the importance of people doing that as well. So I think it's really important as well, that especially from a senior leader point of view within a business, it isn't always about you being vocal about your story. 
It's about just setting, you know, the senior leaders up with the tools and the education to know that it's okay to empower others if they want to share their story as well. Um, Nancy says, what is a clothing brand? So hopefully we've got that as well. Uh, lots of people saying George was relatable. Uh, Mike says, I've been using the Dailyo app to help me be mindful of how I'm feeling and to remind me to do activities which make me feel better. It's been really helpful. Love that, Mike. We're also working on a sort of, you know, journaling element to the EveryMind app as well. So um, that's definitely in the the, the, the pipe works. It's going to take a bit of time, but um, for me, journaling has been key. And obviously, similar to Dalio, I believe it is, you know, you can kind of see what were the days where you was feeling good and why and kind of trace that back as well, which I think is really, really important. Um, good stuff. Therese says, I think we sometimes are afraid to say because of others, because of judgment by others. And then when someone speaks about something you experience, it really helps to open up. Paul, do you have any suggestions or resources for people that need to talk but just can't open up? Hmm. This is a question I get asked the most personally whenever I do webinars or workshops is, is I'm trying to help someone, but, you know, they don't want to talk about it. Now, a um, couple of things, you know, whenever I talk about supporting others, I always say, we don't all have the ability to be a clinical psychologist, but we all have the ability to ask and listen. And what I mean by that is ask, listen, signpost. So whenever we want to support someone, we just have to remember ask, listen, signpost. And what that essentially means is I'm gonna ask, Anita in this example, I'm gonna ask you how you are. But at the same time, I'm not just gonna ask you once, I'm gonna ask you twice. Anita, how are you? I'm fine. Oh, it's just I've noticed that, you know, these last couple of weeks have been difficult for you. Um, I know you might not want to talk to me, but I'm just checking in. Are you OK? That asking twice is such a pivotal part of getting more people to talk about, you know, how they're feeling. It was the way that Anne, my therapist, got me to talk. She asked me twice because I was a brick wall. I wasn't going to talk about my problems. Um, that makes me weak, right? So asking twice is really about that. You know, we've noticed a bit of behavior changes. We've noticed something's happening. We've, we've, we, we just want to check in on this person. If I say to them, how are you? We naturally default to I'm fine, especially in the UK. Let's be honest. How are you is now our new way of saying hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Anyway, let's crack on with the conversation, right? So how are you actually means how are you feeling? So asking twice, that second question shows compassion, shows that I care. It shows Anita that, hey, I'm sitting with you. I've got time if you want to talk about this. This isn't just a how are you conversation. So I think that asking twice is really key. Then it's listening. If someone wants to tell us how they're feeling, amazing. We're going to give them that opportunity and we're going to 100% listen. We're going to give them silence. We're going to give them space. We're not going to judge them. We're just going to listen. We're just going to be that ear. A lot of times people just want someone to talk to. They don't want a solution. They just want that ear for people to kind of, you know, be there for them. And trust me when I say this, no one likes an awkward silence. So if you give yourself like three seconds, right? How awkward is that? I want to feel that silence. You guys think that something's wrong with me. You guys want to jump in and, and, and talk as well. Like no one likes that silence. So if I give Anita that silence, Anita might talk more and talk more and talk more. And trust me, there's been so many times where this has happened to me and people are saying, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I don't know why I'm telling you this. And, and all I'm doing is listening. I'm listening. But at the same time, what I've learned, you know, through my experience is I'm, I'm, I'm not their therapist. I cannot solve their problems for them. I can ask, I can listen, I can show compassion, I can be non-judgmental, I can you know, be there for them, I can be that ear that they might need, but I now need to signpost. I now need to be confident that I have the right people that I can bring in, that I can signpost them to, for them to get that extra support. So as George says, George could offload about how he's feeling to me, I'm open for that, but I'm not gonna be that individual that, that helps him with OCD. I'm not going to be that individual, but I'm going to signpost him to people that can help him. And I'm going to support him through that process as well. So I think ask, listen, signpost so key. But if we just come back to that original question, Anita, of if people don't want to talk about it, like, that, you know, that's out of our control. You know, I get asked this so much, especially with men. You know, you're very vocal about your mental health, Paul. How do I get my husband to talk about his mental health? everyone's so different you know it still took me three or four years i was a brick wall to talk about it to just even one person and that was a therapist you know it took me even longer to talk to the people close to me and i think the key thing there anita is just letting them know that you're there like hey 
I know that you don't want to talk about this, um, but equally, I'm here. I'm here for you if you ever want to talk. Like I'm, I'm ready. And and it's that that reminder. I would take that away as a man in particular, and I'd say I don't want to talk about it now. But I, I'm I feel supported. I feel less alone because someone has said that they're there for me if I do want to talk about it. And that time might be next week, next month, you know, tomorrow, next year, a couple of years time. But it's just them knowing that there's someone there to talk to if they want to. Um, but I think the danger is, you know, we are very reactive with it. Typically, we'll wait until the last minute um, before we start talking about it. Joe says it's so important to take the time to make sure you look after yourself mentally and physically. It can help not just you, but your whole family. 100% Joe. That is a new shift that I think we need to have. Like when I'm out for that run, it's like I'm doing this for my family, right? I'm not doing this just for myself. Janine says, I was brought up to say I'm fine when asked how I was. My parents believed that the more you said fine, then that would become so. Yeah, right. That's just that's just the generation sort of conditioning around mental health and not talking about how we feel. I can't remember what culture it was, just quickly, guys, but I think it was a guy, I think he came from Holland and he came over to the UK and he was working in a company I think it was I think it was a uh, I think it was Mercer. I think I did a talk in Mercer. And he he put he stood up after my talk and he said, I, I found it so strange that when I came to the UK and I walked past someone in the office and said, How are you? They just said, Yeah, I'm fine, and walked off. And then he said, Then I found it even stranger when someone said to me, How are you? And I started to tell them how I was feeling and they didn't know what to do. And I was like, That's this is so it's so true, right? <laughs> you know, how are you? Oh, you know. You know, and then you start opening up to them and they don't expect that because they just expect this, I'm fine, you know, this default answer that typically we get. Um, Kirsten says it depends on your personality preferences. Some people process things better out loud with someone else. Some people are analytical and might find structured exercises work for them. Some people are more introverted and they find it easier to process things on their own heads, et cetera, et cetera. Massively, massively agree. You know, it's so individual. There's, there's no one question, one technique one therapist, one type of therapy that will solve everyone's mental health problems. It's so individual. But I think, you know, just bringing this back before we wrap up, if there's no other questions, it's going back to what George says. You know, if you can take anything away from this this webinar today, it is that knowing that you're not alone, just finding that outlet. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a person. It could just be that you're journaling, you're writing it down, or you're finding that outlet that's for you. You know, just so you feel, you know, more supported with 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 what you're going through. And and then and then finally it is that finding that that strategy that's individual to you. You know, what is it that you're doing and you're doing on a daily basis and you're proactively managing your mental health that makes you feel better when you do it? I think that's so key alongside obviously, as George said, the personal experience element. Now we can transfer that into that business as well. Um guys, any questions? If you've got any questions, just say no um before we wrap up. But I don't want to leave if one of you guys have a question. Now, this is, I think, as well, it's about being consistent. If you're offering or listening in the ear, don't make it one off. Sorry, let's start that again. Um, <laughs> I think as well, it's about being consistent. If you're offering a listening ear, don't make that a one off, especially if someone takes you up on the offer. Love that. It's always intent, right? How are you? You know, what's the intent behind that question? Is it that I want to find out how you are? Or is it that I just want to say hello? Um, I think, as you say, Nancy, that intent is, is key. No worries, Jess. No worries, Anita. No worries, Delia. No worries, Teresa, Mike, Marie. No worries. No worries, guys. Um, good stuff. Really appreciate you taking the time out. Like I said, if you have got access to the Every Mind app, we've got more features coming. We've got more content coming. Definitely um, go check that out. Really appreciate you all taking the time out. Next month, we'll have another guest speaker. We'll have another topic of discussion. Um, but like I say, really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to spend some time with us today. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your week. And I'm sure I'll speak to you all very, very soon. All right, bye.